Nearly 30 years ago, Bruce Willis starred in an action movie that made fans die hard for this movie and the four that followed as a result of its booming success. You think you know the whole story? Think again. I'm your host, Alan, and I'm here to tell you about how an off-duty officer takes on a group of highly organized criminals and makes sweet yippee Kaye box office history. Sit back, take off your shoes, make fists with your toes, and get ready for Cinematica's 107 facts you should know about Die Hard. Number 1. Die Hard was directed by John McTiernan, who has previously directed Predator and Hunt for Red October. Number 2. McTiernan didn't want to direct the film at first, as he thought the concept was too dark. When he did eventually sign on, he tried to lighten the edge by changing the terrorists into robbers, which made the whole premise less serious and less political. Number 3. McTiernan hired Dutch cinematographer Jan de Bont to give the movie a more fluid, character-centric European style, which would be based more around emotion and story flow than physical setting. Number 4. It was written by Stephen E. D'Souza and Jeb Stewart. Their screenplay was based on the 1979 Roderick Thorpe novel Nothing Lasts Forever, which itself was a sequel to the book The Detective, the film adaptation of which starred Frank Sinatra. Number 5. After McLean compliments Takagi on the company's Christmas party, Takagi jokes to him, Pearl Harbor didn't work out, so we got you a tape deck. Actor James Shigeta had actually appeared in several films about Pearl Harbor, including Bridge to the Sun and Midway. Number 6. Thorpe first got the idea for Nothing Lasts Forever after seeing The Towering Inferno, a nightmare about a man being chased by a group of people with guns through a skyscraper. With the success of The Detective and studio's interest in another movie, Thorpe adapted his idea into the new installment. Number 7. Due to his previous work as a protagonist, Joe Leland, Sinatra was the first one offered the role in Nothing Lasts Forever. He declined, however, fortunately for us. Number 8. After Thorpe completed his book, he made a deal with Fox that ensured that he'd receive the bulk of his paycheck after the film was already made. Bad move, dude. Unfortunately, Detective star Frank Sinatra turned down the role and the book itself barely sold despite good reviews. Number 9. Willis originally had to turn down the role due to his commitment to the wonderful TV show Moonlighting. However, when his co-star Sybil Shepard became pregnant, they were given 11 weeks off, enough time to do the movie. Number 10. Bruce Willis was drawn to the role by John McClane's vulnerability and his humanity, which was a far cry from the other impossibly badass protagonists of 1980s action flicks. Number 11. Around the time of Die Hard's release, when asked if he was concerned about being typecast as an action star, Bruce Willis said that he would pick his roles carefully going forward so that wouldn't happen. Number 12. According to Willis, producer Larry Gordon is the person responsible for successfully negotiating him on board. Gordon would later produce Die Hard 2 as well as other projects written by Die Hard co-writer Jeb Stewart. Number 13. Gordon also helped Bruce Willis achieve his unfathomable $5 million paycheck, something he was only able to obtain due to his increased value after the successful opening of his previous movie, Blind Date. Number 14. McTiernan and producer Joel Silver discovered Alan Rickman when they saw him as Vicomte de Valmont in the play Dangerous Liaisons. Number 15. This was Alan Rickman's first feature film at the age of 42. Previously, he had only appeared in stage and television productions. Number 16. Rickman had only been in Los Angeles a few days before he was offered the role of Hans Gruber. At first, he refused it, as he had no interest in doing an action movie. He was persuaded, however, after people informed him how impossibly rare it is to be cast so quickly. Number 17. According to Rickman, he was the one to suggest that Hans Gruber dress in a suit rather than in tactical gear like the rest of the goons. Upon delivering these ideas to producer Joel Silver in a note, he was shot down, yet the next script he received bore the changes. Number 18. Rickman was nervous handling the weaponry, so he would wince every time he fired a firearm. As a result, McTiernan had to cut away from his face during those parts. However, some of these made it into the final film. Take a close look at Rickman's face during the shoot the glass scene. Scheiße and Fiste. Number 19. It's only appropriate that the death of a great businessman would be followed by money changing hands. After Hans shoots Takagi in the face, Carl slips Theo cash, apparently signaling that the two had bet on whether or not the executive would give up the code. Number 20. While playing Harry Ellis, 
Hart Bachner determined that the character's cocaine use was really a mask for his insecurities, leading to a loosened up hyper performance during rehearsals. McTiernan, however, was not a fan of the act and demanded that he play Ellis more smooth like Cary Grant. He reconsidered this direction, however, after discovering that the producers preferred Bachner's interpretation. Number 21. Al Powell's Twinkie obsession came back to haunt the actor who played him. After appearing in the Die Hard franchise, Reginald Vell Johnson often got people throwing Twinkies at him sometimes even into his car. Number 22, Reginald Vell Johnson reprised his role as Sergeant Al Powell in a Christmas episode of Chuck titled Chuck vs. Santa Claus. Number 23, due to the massive success of the film, a popular trope saw other movies with similar premises described as Die Hard on a Train, for example, or Die Hard on a Plane, or Die Hard Dress Up Like a Woman to Get Your Kids Back. Number 24, there is an off-sided rumor that Nothing Lasts Forever was going to be turned into Commando 2, a sequel to the Arnold Schwarzenegger movie. Steven E. D'Souza, who wrote both Commando and Die Hard, has confirmed that this is completely untrue and that those movies are unconnected. Number 25, despite the Christmas time setting and its popularity as a holiday movie, Die Hard was released on July 15th, 1988. Number 26, the Nakatomi Plaza is actually Fox Plaza, the headquarters of 20th Century Fox. It was production designer Jackson Degovia who decided to feature the building, which was still under construction at the time. The scenes of McLean in an unfinished construction area were actually incomplete parts of Fox Plaza. Number 27. Several of the movie's taglines claim that the building has 40 stories, when in actuality, the Fox Plaza is 35 stories high. Number 28. The tagline also referenced 12 terrorists. There are actually 13 in the movie. Number 29. Dying is hard but translating Die Hard is harder. The movie received a slew of strangely adapted titles, including the Spanish Crystal Jungle, the Polish The Glass Trap, and the Hungarian Give Your Life Expensive, among others. Number 30, Die Hard has some Shakespearean influences. In the original script and novel, the story takes place over the course of three days. McTiernan, inspired by Shakespeare in Midsummer Night's Dream, decided to condense the action into one night, just to make that night special. Number 31, filming began without a written ending. A lot of the major scenes and dialogue were written or ad-libbed along the way. In fact, the revisions were so constant that they eventually ran out of colors to designate which version of the script they were up to. Number 32, as the script was still changing as it was being filmed, McTiernan hadn't figured out the essence of John McClane's character until the middle of production. Once he and Willis resolved that the New York cop was somewhat self-loathing but still trying his best, they inserted new shots like the one of McClane banging his head against the doorframe after fighting with his wife. Number 33, an example of the spontaneity of the production, the Nakatomi computer room was constructed before they even knew what they were going to use it for. Number 34, the first shot that Bruce Willis did on the very first night of shooting was his dive from the roof. At first, he didn't realize the extent of the stunt, that they were going to be blowing up large bags of gasoline behind him. On the way down, he nearly missed the airbag. When Bruce Willis asked why they would begin with such a dangerous scene, production explained that, well, if he died, it'd be easier to reshoot now than at the end. Number 35. The airplane scene in the beginning was filmed by towing a fuselage in circles on the ground. Number 36. McLean's giant teddy bear appears again in McTiernan's 1990 movie, The Hunt for Red October. Number 37. Near the beginning of the movie, Argyle turns on a song by Run DMC. When Willis requests that he put on Christmas music instead, Argyle informs him, this is Christmas music. This can be seen as allegorical of Die Hard itself, which does not appear to be a typical Christmas movie at surface level, but totally is one. Number 38. The Nakatomi were a clan in ancient Japan, which raised a rebellion against the rival Soga clan in order to become the most influential family. The Nakatomi company in the film, Mir the wealth and influence of that ancient clan. Number 39. The original Nakatomi logo resembled a swastika. It was designed by Degovia, but shot down by McTiernan due to its similarities to the symbol. The updated design seen in the film looks more like a samurai helmet. A little bit less murder there. Number 40. To bring out a subtle sense of joy in the soundtrack, McTiernan asked composer Michael Kamen to integrate sections of a particular piece of music into the soundtrack. Later on, he learned that the track in question was appropriately enough 
Ode to Joy. Number 41. According to Degovia, Takagi has a backstory. He served during World War II in the Japanese Navy on a ship called the Akagi, or Red Castle. The vault password then is named after the battleship. Number 42. Holly's last name is continuously spelled two different ways throughout the film. On the Nakatomi computer in the beginning, it's spelled as Gennaro with an A, but changes to Gennaro with an E after McLean touches the screen. Her name is also spelled as Gennaro with an A in the credits. Number 43. McLean's signature gun, used in the first three Die Hard movies, is a Beretta 92F. Number 44. McLean's famous catchphrase, Yippie Kaye, is a reference to the song from the Roy Rogers show, Pecos Bill. The song is about a western superman with the chorus that sings, Yippie Aye, Yippie Aye Yo, He's the Toughest Critter, West of the Alamo. It's sung exactly like that. Number 45. Even though Fox was filming in their own building, they still charged the production rent for the time they spent shooting in that space. Number 46. Some of the architecture on the 34th floor resembles Frank Lloyd Wright's Falling Water. According to Degovia in the movie's lore, that actually is the Falling Water, purchased by the Nakatomi Company and repurposed in their own building. Number 47. Since the scenes on the 34th floor were shot in a studio, a long painting was used to show the view of LA from the windows. The 380-foot-long painting even had flickering lights built in to synthesize traffic. Fox still uses it for other films on occasion. Number 48. The logo on the terrorist truck, Pacific Courier, ironically translates to Messenger of Peace. You can see similar logos that appear on the truck in the beginning of Die Hard with a Vengeance as Atlantic Courier, and at the end of Die Hard on a Bus, Speed, painted on the side of a plane. Number 49. It took months of negotiations with Fox just for the production to be permitted to do the scene in which the SWAT armored Humvee knocks over the railing in front of the plaza. Number 50. Most of the terrorists speak in broken German. German, but very few of the actors playing them were actually even German. Andres Wisniewski, who plays Tony, is one of the few who were. Number 51. One of the famous one-liners, Come out to the coast, we'll get together, have a few laughs, spoken by McLean in the vent, was actually written on the spot and fed to Willis through an old cell phone. Similar instances happened throughout the production. Number 52. Bruce Willis did his own stunts, including riding on top of the elevator and jumping 25 feet from the top of the building. Number 53. A botched stunt was incorporated into the final cut. The part in which McLean falls down the ventilation shaft but catches himself was not actually part of the script. The stuntman accidentally fell while shooting the scene. Editor Frank Uriost decided to keep it in the movie though, so the footage of the accident is in the finished film. Number 54. Hey, you guys remember Ellis's line, Hans, Booby, I'm your white knight. Yeah, of course you do. He completely made it up. Number 55. Alan Rickman, who plays the German antagonist, is actually British, whereas Bruce Willis was born in Germany to a German mother. Number 56. Demi Moore was on set quite frequently as she was planning her wedding with Bruce Willis, but she rarely spoke to or acknowledged any of the other actors. Number 57. The production team had wanted a scene in which McLean and Gruber could meet before the climax. When they saw one day that Alan Rickman could pull off an American accent, they introduced the scene with Bill Clay. Number 58. That also happened to be Rickman's first scene, and he did it on one leg. After jumping off of a ledge as part of a sequence, Rickman heard a not-so-reassuring breaking sound. After going to the hospital, he learned that he had badly damaged his knee, and so he had to hide a leg brace beneath his pants for the duration of that scene. Number 59. That scene wasn't even rehearsed. They chose to act it out on the spot to increase the tension. Number 60. Despite the addition, McTiernan says that he is still unsatisfied with the American accent and can still hear Rickman's name. Native British intonations. You don't work for Nakatomi. Number 61. Some parts of the movie were actually shot on Christmas Eve to ensure that the film could be completed for its summer release. Number 62. Even though John McClane and Al Powell mainly communicate via walkie-talkie, Reginald Vell Johnson was actually in the same room as Bruce Willis during his half of the scenes. Willis, however, did not show up for Vell Johnson's half, so he had difficulty performing with just the radio. Number 63. Among the other films shot at the Die Hard building are Speed, Lethal Weapon 2, Airheads, Cyber Tracker 2, Motoroma, and Fight Club, which shows it being blown up again. Number 64. Die Hard was the first feature-length film written by Jeb Stewart, who would later write for Harrison Ford in The Fugitive, Sylvester Stallone in Lock Up, and Steven Seagal in Fire Down Below. Number 65. Co-writer Steve E. D'Souza, who had previously written The Running Man and Commando, both Schwarzenegger movies, would go on to write Die Hard 2 and Ricochet, starring Denzel Washington and John Lithgow. Number 66. Gail Wallens, played by 
Mary Ellen Trainer appears not only in Die Hard, but also in the movie Ricochet as the same LA reporter. Number 67, Yuli's sudden candy craving was improvised by the actor. Actor Al Leung had the idea on set and made sure to consult with McTiernan first before he started messing with the shot. Number 68, McTiernan didn't like the piece of music that Michael Kamen scored for the scene in which Powell shoots Carl. So they went with the purchase track, Resolutions and Hyperspace, that was originally written by James Horner for the movie Aliens. Number 69, the helicopter sequence on the roof of Fox Plaza required three runs, nine camera crews, and six months of planning to shoot. They were given only two hours to film and actually called off two helicopter runs just to avoid any potential incidents. Number seven, in the climax of Die Hard, Gruber attempts to drag Holly out of the plaza with him as he plummets to his death but fails. In the book, however, it's the protagonist's daughter who is in jeopardy and Gruber successfully takes her down with him. This launches the protagonist into a killing spree of the remaining activists occupying the building. Apparently this didn't fit McTiernan's feel-good summer entertainment vibe for some reason. Number 71. For Hans Gruber's death scene, Alan Rickman dropped from a 20-foot high model onto an airbag. The fear in his face is genuine, too. A stuntman released him on the count of two rather than three as Rickman expected. The first take is the one used in the movie. Number 72. You heard of Chekhov's gun? Well, Die Hard has foreshadowing from Chekhov's watch. When Ellis first flexes on McLean by telling Holly to show him the Rolex that he bought her, McLean responds, I'm sure I'll see it later. See it later he does, as in the climax, when Hans is holding onto the watch and McLean unhooks it to save Holly's life. Number 73. McLean's line, hi honey, when he first sees Holly at the end of the movie was improvised by Willis. Number 74. Total body count, 22, we think. There's some contention over this number, but many place it between 20 and 22. Number 75. In the episode of Moonlighting, when girls collide, worlds collide as a Die Hard poster can be seen as it's being taken down from a shop wall. Number 76. In the German version of the movie, the terrorists are turned into Irish activists and given Angela-sized names such as Jack, Charlie, and Henry. Number 77. Cinematographer Jan de Bont would go on to direct Speed, aka Die Hard on a Bus. Number 78. This is only the fourth highest grossing Die Hard movie, surpassing only 2013's A Good Day to Die Hard, but we don't talk about that movie ever. Ever. Number 79. The extended edition is only extended by about 62 seconds, which mainly consists of an additional scene in which the FBI tries to shut down the power to Nakatomi Plaza and fails before moving on to shutting down the entire block. Number 80. McLean's parting line to Gruber, Happy Trails, is another Roy Rogers reference. The line is part of the closing part of the Roy Rogers show, Happy Trails to You. Number 81. Die Hard grossed over $83 million domestically, accumulating the highest income in its second week with nearly $11 million. Number 82. A Die Hard video game was released for NES two years after the movie came out. It's a top-down shooter that closely follows the movie's story as players take control of McLean to fight the terrorists. Number 83. Ever notice how big McLean's feet are in some shots? That's because Bruce Willis wore rubber shoes designed to look like actual feet for various parts of the movie, like when the terrorists shoot out the glass windows. Number 84. Hans was previously kicked out of a West German terrorist group called the Volksfrei Movement, which translates to the Free People Movement. Considering that taking a building hostage is the opposite of freeing people, it's no wonder he got the boot. Number 85. Before he became an actor, Alexander Gudunov, who plays Carl, was a famous ballet dancer who defected from the Soviet Union. Did I say his last name right? I'm not sure, but it was good enough. Number 86. The phone numbers and addresses of the Nakatomi Plaza team seen in the LAPD dispatch computer, that's all the real information of the Fox Plaza management. Number 87. Despite popular rumors that Willis was moonlighting on the Die Hard set while filming his show Moonlighting, thereby explaining why all his scenes in the movie are at night, he claims that the crossover time was limited to only a few days. Number 88. The police dispatcher who tells Powell to go to Nakatomi Plaza calls it a code 2. This means that there is an urgent incident, but sirens are not to be used. Number 89. When Powell asks McLean how his feet are doing, he says, all things being equal, I'd rather be in Philadelphia. This is a famous quote by W.C. Fields, a comedian who hated Philadelphia, but apparently not as much as he hated death. Number 90. Reginald Vell Johnson has played a cop in Die Hard, Turner and Hooch, Ghostbusters, and Family Matters. After his performance in Die Hard, real police officers would thank him for his depiction. Number 91. Bruce Willis has also played a noteworthy amount of cops. Die Hard, 16 Blocks, Hostage, 
The Last Boy Scout, Mercury Rising, and Surrogates are all on the list. Number 92. Hans Berenger, who plays Fritz, sent the set into a fit of laughter. As the military vehicles close in on the terrorists, he was supposed to inform Gruber that they're using their artillery on us. Instead, the line came out, they're using the elderly on us. That would have made for a much different movie, right? Number 93. The quarterback is toast. One of the most memorable lines in the movie was actually thought up by Clarence Gerard Jr. who played Theo. Number 94. Actor Anthony Peck plays an LAPD officer who looks over Powell after he's attacked by the terrorists. Peck would later play an NYPD officer named Ricky Walsh in Die Hard with a Vengeance. Number 95. In the film, there are two agents, both named Johnson, and a news anchor, Harvey Johnson. They are all named after Reginald Vell Johnson. Number 96. Early posters for the film intentionally featured the Nakatomi building more prominently than Bruce Willis, so as not to detract non-fans. After the movie proved a box office success, however, the posters were adjusted. Number 97. Robert Davi, who plays Agent Johnson, is a close friend of Arnold Schwarzenegger and watched the movie together with him. When Davi's character appeared and took charge, Schwarzenegger assumed that he was going to be the hero of the movie. As it became more clear that Agent Johnson was a less than heroic person, Schwarzenegger apparently became Came disappointed and continuously whispered about how much of an idiot the character was. Number 98. According to McTiernan, many of the explosions seen in the movie were actually real and set off while shooting on location at Fox Plaza. Number 99. Composer Michael Kamen was reluctant to adapt Beethoven as part of an action movie, deeming it sacrilegious. I will make mincemeat out of Wagner or Strauss for you, Kamen said, but why Beethoven? McTiernan then explained that Beethoven had been used in Stanley Kubrick's A Clockwork Orange as a theme of its violent moments. Kamen accepted this explanation, now viewing Die Hard's villains as spiritual descendants of the Clockwork Orange villains. Number 100. Edgar Degas's École de Danse can be seen inside the Nakatomi vaults. Its name is French for School of Ballet. Number 101. Because the film was being written on the fly, the reveal of the terrorist ambulance was not originally part of it. This is fairly clear by the fact that the truck is clearly not big enough to hold an ambulance. Number 102. To add to the sense of hyper-realism, McTiernan wanted the prop guns to use extra loud blanks. During a close quarter scene in which McLean shoots a terrorist from under a table, one gunshot was too close to Bruce Willis's ear and caused him permanent two-thirds partial hearing loss. Number 103. When Richard Thornburg is discussing his dinner reservations, he mentions, of course I can get a table. Wolfgang is a close personal friend of mine. This is a reference to Wolfgang Puck, owner of the restaurant Spago on the Sunset Strip that opened in 1982. Number 104. Supposedly, Bruce Willis hand-selected Bonnie Bedelia to play the role of Holly Gennaro after being impressed with her work. Willis, however, has denied his involvement, perhaps out of modesty. Number 105. According to Bruce Willis, his iconic catchphrase, yippee mother was originally intended as a throwaway line before it was integrated into the script. Number 106. McLean tells Powell that the terrorists have enough plastic explosive to orbit Arnold Schwarzenegger. Good thing Schwarzenegger didn't take the role then, even though he was one of the first actors considered for the part. And this is it, guys, number 107. Among the other actors considered for the role of John McClane were Richard Gere, Sylvester Stallone, Burt Reynolds, and Clint Eastwood. Guys, crucify me in the comments if you want, but I could totally see 1988 Richard Gere pulling off this role extremely well. Thanks for watching Cinematica's 107 Facts You Should Know About Die Hard. Like what you just saw? We've got more 107 Facts coming out next week. And if you love obsessing over movies and TV, be sure to tell your friends. Like this video and subscribe to Cinematica, where we help you watch smarter.